So I think we had, uh, what, like 30 people walking around a Rivian and, uh, and a Polestar for, for five minutes. So um, I think maybe the best way to restart here is just give the, the Reeves brothers uh, an opportunity to kind of walk through what you saw um, and the capabilities uh, of the demo. And then, yeah, maybe more than 30 seconds this time, we'll walk through a little bit of what people saw and some Q&A, yeah. and then we'll get to the indoor stuff. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Yeah, cut it short inside, cut it short outside, and so now we can take our time and, and walk through kind of what the uh, what the demo was and um, how it can either be extended or uh, augmented with some other capabilities. So, yeah, I like to think of the the holy grail of renewable energy as solar, EV charging, and battery energy storage systems, right? And so the reason Intelligent was uh, so gracious enough to come down is obviously they're running Pionix Everest, right? So kind of the, the super set of demos that we did yesterday, running Pionix Everest using Phytech uh, hardware uh, and putting it all together in a uh, production ready system. So without further ado, I'll let David and, and Brian come back uh, a little rain soaked and talk through what we saw. Hi again, so what you saw was a, a 12 and a half kilowatt DC coupled DC charger. Um, as it was mentioned, you know, we're, we're running off of uh, uh, Everest. Uh, we work with Pionix and we work with Vitec. Uh For anyone here who's thinking of coming aboard that train, I gotta say the support from both those teams have been excellent. So I really wanna thank them. Um, and uh, I know that our technical team back in uh, uh, Toronto is where we do the, uh, the communications development, the board development, uh, is really complimentary to that team. So I want to thank those guys. Um, <clears throat> that uh, demo you saw was based on architecture. It has two sets of converters. The first converter manages the variable DC input that would be coming in. And then the second converter is the converter that's uh, in contact with the vehicle, matching what the vehicle is asking for. <clears throat> uh, that brings in, again, variable DC source. Uh, and, and then we'll match it up to what the car is. That is a DC-10 solution, um, power class 10 uh, solution. Uh, we're looking at, I think it's 200 to 550 volts to the vehicle. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have other architectures that we're looking at, 25 kilowatts that would uh, go all the way to 920. <clears throat> um, the technology is bi-directional as well. Now, when you're Obviously, you're not going to be charging solar panels, but the intent is to con connect this up to different sorts of DC buses. So it could be a, a hybrid inverter that is, again, on the same uh, DC bus that is charging a 400-volt battery in a, in a, a PV hybrid inverter. Uh, and this would allow the car to both charge uh, in DC without having to worry about any losses associated with the AC to DC conversion. Uh, either from power coming from, from solar panels or from uh, the home storage battery. Um, and then secondly, uh, when you're discharging back to the inverter, the charger doesn't have to worry about any of the islanding or any of that nonsense. We're just giving the power to the inverter. And then the inverter, in, you know, if it's in communication with, the, with uh, the utility, decide how it wants to manage that power. If it's going to the grid, it wants to store it back into the home battery for future use, or wants to convert it in a power outage and, and use it in the home. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we're implementing everything that's in the Pionic stack, so it's so OCPP capable and whatnot. This version doesn't have a lot of connectivity, but when you see the, the PyTech board, <coughs> um, it's laid out to have all the bells and whistles enabled, and it's just a deep hop situation for us. So as we go up in class, in terms of the functionality of the device, we'll add more and more options um, to, the, to the board. Um, and, uh, I, and, and we're looking at different implementations, like I said, PV hybrid inverters, uh, battery storage systems, so large, you know, two megawatt battery storage systems to have a DC bus coming off of it for fleet charging or uh, public charging, as well as DC microgrids, especially for fleet solutions. So keeping everything on DC or charging DC at like an 800 volt bus uh, is, is a lot more energy efficient, especially if you're adding solar and battery storage to that, keeping everything you know, behind the meter in DC is a lot more efficient and uh, a, 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 a lot uh, less expensive to operate. So anyone have any questions about that? So, 
So in different, this, our first product that's releasing is simply connected to solar panel, uh, like a solar canopy. If we're looking at connecting up to, say, a PV inverter, um, in that case, yes, the, the, we worked with inverter companies to look at situations where if you're not getting enough power from solar panels, you can pull from the, from the battery and also pull from the grid, right, and convert to DC because those hybrid inverters allow you to take AC, convert to DC, and charge a home battery. So on that, on that DC bus, there's a 400-volt DC bus between the initial uh, buck boost converters that that talk to or are connected to the solar panels and the AC DC converter that connects to the grid. There's a 400 volt bus that right now is used to charge 400 volt uh, connected home batteries. We're on that same bus. So all we have to do is, you know, we're working with our partners to initiate the, the protocols of how you're, where you're going to turn on the terminals connected to the charger and why. And you can set up a user situation where I just want to charge. I come home, I plug in. I just want to charge while the sun's shining. So I'm only going to use solar as being generated on the roof that I'm not being used for my home load. Or it could be I want to be energy efficient. So I want to charge both from solar that's being currently generated and my home battery, assuming my home battery had been charged by solar before. Or I want to fast charge. So I want to max out the capacity of the charger. I'm going to take from solar, battery, and if necessary, from the grid and put it all on that DC bus and, and, and connect everything to the car. Or, and then the fourth option is I want to be at 80% state of charge by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and let you know, uh, an algorithm figure it out. So it's going, to sit, it's going to know the pricing. It's going to know what it costs me to fill my, battery, my home's battery. I know what's going to, you know, I, I can predict the weather, see how long I'm going to get solar. I have a, an idea of what my house load is between now because of temperature. I'm going to run air conditioning or I'm not. And it will figure out the cheapest way to charge the vehicle. So by 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm at 80% capacity. Yes. And, yeah. So, so the question was, um, if if this is a solar-based charger, what happens when a not, a not enough solar is being produced, and and can you supplement it with other sources such as the grid or or battery? In this particular demo, what you saw in this configuration, this solution is a niche product that is only connected to two PV strings. Uh, so photovoltaic strings. So you you know you have a set of solar panels. They're each they're all connected in series and connected into into the in the inputs. But in this technology, it's basically a DC input. So one of our uh, our initial thought, but what we're working with or some of our partners with is hybrid uh, photovoltaic inverters, and there they're able to have different energy sources contribute to an internal 400 volt DC bus. So you would have photovoltaic coming from the roof uh, and into a, a set of buck boost converters from each PV string and they, they boost or buck up to, to 400 volts to energize that 400 volt line. That 400 volt line ultimately feeds into the AC to DC converter which will take that DC converted to AC 240 or uh, 120, depending on what output is needed, and then put in the house load or, or ultimately to the grid. Uh, in between on that 400 volt bus is uh, the newest kind of uh, standard to charge 400 volt home batteries. So for, uh, home batteries are going from 48 volt standard to a 400 volt standard because they're more efficient. We would connect up to that same DC bus, so have our own terminal inputs. And in fact, uh, I think the Delta inverter that's used uh, with the Ford home uh, energy integration uh, system has a separate input uh, for a DC, uh, for, for an EV charger <coughs> connected to the, their DC bus. 
And what we would then do is this device would hang on that DC bus. So we would pull power from that DC bus. How that DC bus gets energized can be a, uh, can, can get power from either photovoltaic and get power from the attached battery or get power from the grid and, and any and all combinations of the three. So from a user perspective, I can choose, for example, just charge, just pull power or charge while the sun's shining and you have photovoltaic, or I also want to add batteries to get a higher charge rate if I can't get the charge rate I want just from uh, you know, what's, what's being produced on the roof, or it's, it's at night, obviously, there's obviously no solar being generated. Uh, and if I really want to fa pa charge fast, I'm going to bypass using green energy that was either stored in the battery or coming from, from solar panels and actually pull from the grid. And the grid and, and the AC to DC converter will invert the AC to DC and put it on that DC bus. So where we're working with our partners is making sure that the DC bus has enough capacity to combine all the three uh, sources and ultimately get to 25 kilowatts. So that would be ultimate for a home charger to have a 25 kilowatt DC home charger. Sure, with me. Great, uh, great presentation. Uh, you know, just really um, thrilled with what you guys are doing. I did. I see huge value, but I, I'm trying to. I spent a while. I would shop module uh, panels for a while. So typical panels, what 300 watts still? 500. 500. 480, 500. Okay, so you're still looking at like 40 panels for one one view. I think to get 25 kilowatts or 12 and a half kilowatts, but again, you can combine different sources, right? So, so you could, if, if, wanted, if you wanted to get that maximum charge rate, which you don't need to have. So this charger was, even though it's rated at 12 and a half kilowatts, it will charge based on the power that's available. So it was charging at well, four. I'm just trying to wrap my room, forgive me if, if I'm going off. But I'm just trying to understand this application. This primary light duty personal vehicle are going to be charged at workplace. Uh, yes, and, and fleet charging uh, for. Do fleets want to gamble with solar availability? So, again, this isn't necessarily solar, it's DC coupled. Oh, right. so, so, we're working with partners yeah, who have. You, you, you're hanging your hat a lot on the model. All we're saying is this first version right. is connected. Like the first version we're commercially releasing is solar panels. Okay, so let's come back and and why, why that was is because we don't need to rely on a partner. I'm, let me rush to the concept. I'm, okay. I'm on board with this concept of the particular light duty vehicle. Let's say 40 panels. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to So we, for example, yeah, so, so a rough calculation, um, when we are at Intersolar, there's a canopy company that will sell you a kit uh, for, the, for the steel for, for a two-bay solar carport, $3,000 uh, for, for all the steel. Now you have to pay for the labor to erect it. It's a DIY project, so someone could do it at home. Uh, and then that particular one, I think, took... 18 panels. So 18 times, I mean, depending if these tariffs kick in, I mean, panels are dirt cheap. I, I saw, yeah, the 480 uh, watt panels in Europe at 35 euros a piece. 35 euros. The Chinese are wow. dumping them below the cost that Western manufacturers can produce them. So solar panels, I don't know if that's going to last, but right now it's dirt cheap. So, uh, and then the charger has an MSRP, this one, of, of $2,500. And we think you can be eligible for tax credits <clears throat> with that as well. So in theory, you're looking at, you know, I don't know what the pencil's out to, like six, seven thousand, eight thousand dollars $8,000 to have a, a, a charging solution. You know, for example, we're talking to a lot of uh, ranchers and farmers uh, who, you know, want to put this up in a field somewhere. It's off-grid. 
and they just will park and charge. And for them, it's a it's a great solution rather than trying to, you know, bring bring AC out to some far end of their field. Yeah, so, pulling an energy tub in California is easily not enough. Yeah. yeah. So this. Just, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Uh, so I'm wondering if you mentioned the more efficient use of these parts, what we can do in the need. But before, there's some additional costs to each use of these seats to keep out the first area, the common water, or whatever. And so, um, what is, how much more efficient is using these seats instead of using the main seats that are already installed? Uh, so uh, if we're so the, the partners we're talking about, there's nothing right this set up. It's it's a it's a difference between installing an AC versus a DC uh, well, distribution well, set, uh, system. I still think you see that it's much more efficient. As you're coming ahead here, you you have numbers like ten percent more efficient, twenty percent more. Oh, uh, you, you more uh, the efficiency. Um, it, it, so it all depends on what you add to the system. So if you're just talking about having a rectifier, for example, so you're pulling two megawatts off the grid and having uh, uh, in, a, in a fleet charging situation, are we talking a fleet charging situation? In general, I would, I would say in general, so for example, if you have in, if you install the system like in your home, you can have a, a, as far as I understand, you have a direct access from your Mm -hmm. And you have maybe a heat pump which also connected to a heat pump, you can connect a battery to the pump, you can connect an AC heat conversion, so you can heat that up or from bidirectional from the grid or into the grid. So that's good, but you could also use all the time AC when you have an AC, all the time an AC heat conversion, which makes the system much more inefficient, I think. I always. Yeah, so, so, so from, from an, an appliance perspective, you're looking at uh, three percent by avoiding a rectifier. Um, in, in terms of battery storage, an AC coupled battery storage system loses at least ten percent round trip. It, 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 like for example, Powerwall or Powerwall Two advertises at uh, ninety percent efficiency at at launch, and then it degrades over time. Whereas if you're using a DC coupled system for energy storage, it's ninety eight percent, ninety seven percent efficient round trip. Um, and in terms of charging a vehicle, for example, the onboard AC to DC converter is, I've seen anything from 80 to 90 percent efficient. Um, not only that, but uh, uh, the, if, if you have a limited, so the, the efficiency you can translate into, you know, charge rate as well, because the, the charger we're showing is 97 and a half percent. Uh, efficient, so you're getting much more of what you're the limited energy you're producing in your home actually into your car. Um, it's an interesting dilemma because we were talking to, for example, PV module manufacturers, and and they're looking at putting together a holistic system. So they, you know, getting it branding an inverter and uh, and battery storage and, and and marketing with their panels. And we talked about the solution, and you know, we're saying, hey, you're going to save up like uh, up to 20% uh, uh, in round trip if if you're putting stuff in your battery and then charging your car with an AC coupled versus a DC coupled solution, and. Uh, and their, their, their executive said, well, does anyone care? And I looked at them and go, you guys would kill if you improve your, your PV module by 3%. You guys would be popping champagne. Here, it's just by taking a different architecture, you can save you know, 20%. Why aren't you, you know, going and, and advertising to these customers? And in my opinion, one of the problems is the whole industry is so siloed, everyone just looks at what they're doing. And everyone else is kind of... Um, you know, outside of, of their concerns. They're worried about energy efficient of their system rather than the, uh, of their device rather than the whole system as a whole. Yes, sir? Go ahead. I also have a uh, comment. So I do see this as a market. There is some other players. And when I, when I ask them, they say, hey, come to it and go to that. And like, how much does this cost you to hold it up? EV, but it's always, right, set up EV, then, 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 I mean by two EV, charge, so low is the anti-cost. So I was wondering how much, how much does it cost for this charge? But 
that particular charger you saw outside? Yes. The, 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 the manufactured suggested retail price is $2,500. It's, you can get it cheaper than that. That's the MSRP, and of course, but that's that's the MSRP. Absolutely. Our problem is we're a little startup and no one knows about us. What we're trying to do is partner with um, uh, uh, solution providers that already have those contacts with the government, with the military, with, uh, with installing uh, uh, carports uh, uh, in, in for, for residential or for, for uh, retail um, and, and office complexes. So our channel to market is really going to be working with partners who have already that expertise are, are going to the military and really going to open any doors. But, you know, we're, we're interested in partnering with everyone uh, to, to deploy the solution where it makes a lot of sense in their applications because we're not fabricators, we're not putting up solar canopies, we're not, we're not even making a charging pedestal for this thing. So um, we're, 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 we're looking at relying on the rest of the, the ecosystem. Yes, sir. It's a mobile. It's a mobile battery. So, so, we, so we, we, we have developed a protocol uh, over Modbus and Canbus. It's, it's uh, based on a SunSpec Dura communication model, which fits in with that whole ecosystem. And so we can plug into inverter or an energy management system. And, if, and it's, a, it's, a, it's based off of a battery model. Uh, but it's somewhat modified for it. But everyone we go to and say, here's our, and, and we have that protocol, we have an SDK, and, and we make that available to our partners, and they have no problems with the integration in terms of how you can communicate back and forth. And, and I guess one question, I'll make the question uh, about that. Uh, are we connected to a, are we connected to a, I remove your system. If I remove that system out of, out of the thing, I can still feed the car. Right? 
this is the idea. How, how would you feed the car through the microgrid? You, you, pardon me? So, so you would have to convert from DC to AC. Oh, and, and either and either then have an so so you convert from DC to AC so you have to have an inverter and that inverter would then say you want to hook up a level two AC charger mm -hmm. so that charger would then pump the car 240 volt 40 amp a, uh, AC then the car needs to convert that AC back to DC I, I that. yeah well that that round trip yeah so so that's that's where the value is in the in the round trip power conversions uh, you lose and, and if you're putting stuff on an ac couple batteries even worse so you're losing a lot of your energy in those ac to dc conversions it's you keep everything dc there there is there is um, there's a whole initiative the whole idea of a dc microgrid and trying to make that a standard has been around in north america for i don't know 40 years um and it's always had fits and starts uh, uh, there are now real um real progress being made to establish standards so one of the things we don't have on the dc microgrid side is what standard if you're going to run dc based led lighting in your house are you using 48 volts 60 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts. Uh, there's no standard, and everyone's picking something different. If you if you want a, a bus in the house, uh, you know, is it 350 volts? Is it 400 volts? In Europe, they look like they standard on 350, 700, 1400, I believe, volt, and then they haven't yet settled on uh, a, like a, a lower voltage lighting. Uh, that looks to be about 48. But in, in North America, there's a big push to match Europe, so we're not mismatched with Europe like we are on the AC side, and have that as being the standards. And uh, there's a, a, a finally kind of uh, a coalescence with a lot of the players. Utilities are on board because they realize they can't supply enough power as we're electrifying everything in the home, right? We're banning uh, feeding in natural gas into homes, so everything's being electrified with hot water heating. Uh, we're having uh, uh, HVAC systems all going to be electrified, and and tr and and we need to supply more power to the homes. But as was mentioned, the feeder, the grid can't feed everything. So having some way of generating on-prem DC, storing DC, having a uh, a, a, a car being a mobile battery charging at work and bringing home, which is opposite from what we do now, but in the future that's probably one of the solutions, uh, is is going to be the solution and keeping everything behind the meter DC and using it DC uh, and only converting to AC when you have to is, is a big push by a lot of the utilities. Uh, and then finally we're getting the big uh, electronic suppliers on board. So finally, ABB and Schneider and all those guys where DC used to be a four letter word is they're realizing they need to actually start making solutions to go there. Yes, sir. That's right. So you might have been listening to Pionix yesterday as they were going through the steps of the charging session and they, they hinted at that. At the end, rather than pull out the plug, there's the really, and they said for those who are connected to like a DC coupled source set, this is where you reinitiate. Now I get it. Right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, do we sell this solution? Do we even ask this question? We don't have a solution for this now. The, the reason is your battery is going to cost more than everything else. I know that. And so, from a practical point of view, people say, well, I, you know, if my car's not there, I'm wasting, I'm forgoing all that solar generation. 
and, uh, and, and, and when battery technology comes down in price, yes. What you would need then in the system is a charge controller, and uh, there's, a, there's a communication between the charger, the charge controller, and the, the battery BMS. So it is, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at charge control, like a charge control partner that could be part of this, but it's not a priority right now because, you know, if, if you want to get any meaningful storage, so you want to store, you know, 30 or 40 kilowatts of power in your batteries, you know, that's $30,000 in batteries. So, so the answer is yes, it can be done. We don't have a solution for it yet. We don't want to make the charge controller because that's what that has to be in between. We're not charging the battery. We need we need something there that's going to charge the battery, and that's a charge controller. Which you know you, you, they're they're available. Uh, we just we just haven't we haven't looked at that as being a priority. So, so we have a lot of inquiries, and I'm I'm on the hunt to find a charge controller company that has both a terminal to connect to the batteries, and then a second load terminal that this would connect to, or figure out some way to back up, connect both of these to the same terminal, and then have the ch charge controller when it gets the signal from the EVSC to say to the battery management system don't charge because it's going to take the load or do charge because there's no load being generated but demanded from the EVSC. So that's something you got to work on. And, uh, and we have a lot of inquiries. I just point out to people, you know, how much the battery is going to be. And they're like, okay, but I still, I'm still, yeah, the frugality of me says I want to put something on there and ca capture that energy. Yeah. Don't have it yet. We know the solution we got to get to, and we're working on it. Sorry, Brian asked me to uh, move it on. Sir, okay. Sir, you can take one more question. Yes, sir. The question was more specific. If I buy the latest generation Tesla Solar and Tesla Powerwall with the gateway, hardware wise, does that have that kind of EV bus? So it does, except <clears throat> the bus is a 48 volt bus. So uh, our solution doesn't boost up from 48 volts, and and that's that's I was surprised that the Powerwall three I guess they use a 48 volt battery system because it's smaller and they can get it all into that package. But for, but if you look at the round trip efficiency to store onto their battery, it's they're losing 10 percent. Uh, and, and it's even though it's DC coupled because they're going from 40 volt, 400 volts to 48 volts and back and forth. Thank you. Uh, instead of batteries. I, you're, you, <laughs> I'm not a battery or capacitor expert, so my 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 background's in steel making, so <laughs> metallurgical engineering. All right, okay. thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, uh, Brian and David here. So um, I don't know if there is any more questions to. Uh, Pionics as well that we saw out there. Uh, if, I don't know if you want to come up or give you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's better to come up here then because otherwise it's not going to get very well recorded. I think. Oh yeah, we can flip. We can maybe. Yeah, you're right. We should flip to that slide.
Yeah. So my question is, that is that commercial? Can you commercialize? Like other than the Roman, can you, you know, can I acquire some ETF or things like that? You know, like uh, on Amazon, and then use the product my product. So we. Can you repeat the question? For yeah. Me? The question was, if you can buy this and charge your car at home? Yes. So we, we sell this, um, but it doesn't deliver much power, so you, it's, it doesn't make sense to charge your car. It's more as a protocol tester to test. If you remember the 15 steps yesterday of, of the DC charging session, this can go up to, it ends at power delivery, basically. Or for AC, yeah. What do you mean? For DC, yeah. Because it can actually charge your car. Oh, it actually charges. So, I, okay. I charge it with one watch. Speaking, yes, it does charge a car, but once you initiate a DC charging station, the car will like uh, prepare the battery and heat it up, and so everyone engage all the fans. So it will actually like discharge. This is not meant for charging. It's meant for protocol testing between the car and the charging. System. But if you're willing to charge it 15 watts, you that's what it draws from the battery oh, okay. <laughs> from its own battery. Yeah. yeah. You're going to need a lot of those small batteries. <laughs> <laughs> it will last a day. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance to increase those with the power? Because we observe that cars have some first need more than one watt for the combat, especially Tesla. Yeah, the problem with that is uh, safety certification. So we are right now going through that, and will be done in roughly six weeks. And so it will be available in our shop in six weeks. The device uh, you can buy, um, but the problem with is the the like um, diesel current. So we cannot increase it much more. Otherwise, the certification will be like a lot, a lot harder. <laughs> That's the reason. That's the downside. Yes. Yes, you can. You can modify. Um, the question was if you can um, modify the software running on the device. Yes, you can. So it has Wi-Fi, and you can SSH on the device and change the config file, as you would do with any ever running uh, charging station. So software-wise, it's just a normal DC charging station, and just has different hardware. So you can modify Everest as you would do. Uh, like anyhow else, you can change the config file, you can even run your own Everest on it. That's easily done. Um, the question is about the retail price. It's around $10,000. Um, it's available at shop.pionics.com. And safety certification in about six weeks. I would say six weeks, including production when it's like ship, um, ready to, to, to ship roughly. It's not a guarantee, but roughly about that. Estimate. Shop.pionics.com. Yep. The question was if it's going to be UL certified? I guess not at the moment. It's no plans for it. Yes. Uh, that's just uh, like uh, the basic usage of Wireshark. It's like um, you have this SSH dump uh, plugin. So you just like connect by SSH to the charging station and you find in Wireshark the, the interface. And then it just dumps out the, the high level communication um, like going on between um, the car and the charging station in the, after the Slack basically is done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know if we go to charge bite now. Um, you introduced your demo. We never saw it out there, so we're gonna do it inside here. But I don't know if it probably makes sense then to go and introduce all the the demos that are set up inside, so to say, uh, because maybe we're going to do that first, or we're going to do that all together. Um, so let me, and the presentation might not be 
uh, everything in complete the right order. So I think we've done uh, charge bytes. Uh, so we're going to go and we're going to go and uh, look at that. We also do have a demo from S44. And I think that's on the on the countertop at the at the back there. Um, so uh, maybe you know, if Mason, you want to come up and just introduce yourself real quick, or and introduce maybe the demo. Or the, actually, I think that there is, yeah, or two. They're connected. Those two demos with charge by. So I don't know. If, So this is this. Right. This can be done. This can be done, but without the CSMS. So this. And you're going to do a separate. Exactly. So you're going to do a separate one of the CSMS here. Okay. Also, we're going to do some connectivity on that. We're not able to get one. Okay. Okay, no, but that's good. Yeah, I think we, we let's do it like that then. I don't know, uh, so maybe you want to come up and introduce, introduce uh, your demo real quick then, and what it's going to be, and... Yeah, we're probably going to do the demo uh, via the presentation, so I don't know if you want to do it now or... Uh, yeah, we'll do it now. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're gonna put your your slides up here. Okay, that should work. I don't know if you. So maybe the easiest is if you can. Are you connected to that web? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then maybe that's the easiest one. You just share your slides because I think then it's gonna come up here as well. I can maybe, if I stop sharing this one, then we're going to see that. Yeah, I put us off a little bit, so yeah. Hopefully we're going to be okay. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, sure. I don't know if you're going to, this is the laptop that runs the rest, so I don't know if we can, we can yeah, maybe, uh, get down yeah, maybe we can, I don't want to close it because yeah. I don't have the password to it, so. Oh, I get you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one more technical problem, please. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Simon. Yeah. Yeah, he's, we're getting signed into the WebEx. Apologies. Sorry, Mac uh, permissions problems here. Yeah, I had to finish. Are we able to see this? Full screen? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, that's fine. It looks like it's working. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yep. Um, all right, so we're going to show off uh, Citrine a little bit. Um, so first I'm going to show us the uh, I think everybody who was here yesterday that's here now, but this is our open source uh, OCPP 2.0.1 CSMS. We're going to do a quick demo, uh, making use of Pionix's Everest solution. Uh, we kind of found out we were doing this demo two days ago, so it's, it's a bit slap dash, but uh, we're going to try to show just connect to the connect to the charger, maybe run a couple a flow or two. And yep. yep. So here we have our. Um, uh, directus instance uh, showing the user interface here. Um, I already have a charger set up, so I'll show you this charger. Um, we can see the location here. Um, currently we have set as S44. We have zero stations available at this time. Um, the station we're going to boot, uh, we can see the charging stations here that we have set up, and there's one here, CP001. That's the one that we're going to be using. Um, so I'm just going to boot uh, Everest here from my Docker. Um, which I already have pointing to this. Uh, there we go. Um, so that should come up in just a moment, and we'll be able to see that it is connected. Yep, so it looks like we received the boot notification. And here we can now see that the charge station is online. Um, and if we open this charge station, we can also see um, some flows over here. So this is where we can do some modifications um, to the charger. Um, if we would like to do a reset, for example, we can click reset. Um, and I think Justin showed this a little bit in the video. Um, we can show that we're doing This. And if we click here, um, it will populate the payload. Um, and if we run this, we did have some issues earlier communicating over the network, so there may be some problems here. I actually don't see the reset making it down to my local Everest. Um, so there may be some network problems here. Yeah, we did have a bit of an issue reaching localhost on TI's Wi-Fi. Uh, um, yeah. So we were doing like some last minute modifications. Hopefully it will uh, work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't appear it's uh, getting through. Um, So uh, the other thing I was going to show is um, I already have this uh, Everest pointing to this cloud instance that we have of um, Citrine, but I was going to also show a local version of Citrine just to see. Um, so I've already had this um, pulled uh, from our repo, um, but just to show how quick and easy it is to get it up and running once you have it pulled. Um, and this is already built, so just running Docker build. Um, but once we build, uh, just to get it up and running, just takes a moment. And it looks like everything's up and running, and we can actually go to our local instance of Directus um, and log in here. So Citrine is up and running, um, and we can get in locally. Uh, as for like creating a charging station, if we wanted to do something like that, uh, you can create a location here. Um, we already have one uh, like similar to what we had in the cloud, um, but we could create one pretty easily. Uh, you can select a charging pool um, and an ID, uh, and 
give the name and the coordinates and all of that that you would like to do. Um, and then to create a charging station, um, it's also very straightforward. Just come in here, type the ID. So this is the station ID that the um, charger is going to send. For example, Everest, um, the one I have since CPO01. Really, all you have to do is that, and you can assign it a location ID. You can also create that from the location itself. Um, so when you go to the location and you're already here, um, you can add an existing charger. Uh, oh, I already have CPO01 created. Um, so I can just select that and add it in and it's automatically added into that location. And then here from the map, we can see, uh, save. And here from the map, we can see that it's now there um, and it'll show like online availability uh, and everything that the charger sends. So yeah, I think that's really all we've got <laughs> to show here, pretty quick demo, but um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a experience into what it looks like to run Citrine. Yeah, thank you. And um, if you are interested in running Citrine, you can get it up on most laptops within about five minutes. Hit our GitHub page, have Docker containers and uh, documentation for how to get it started. If you do run into any problems, join our Discord. Uh, our whole dev team monitors it uh, daily, so we can get you an answer right now. Okay. If anybody has any questions now, we'll do our best to field them. And we'll also be set up in the back if uh, anyone wants to try to yeah, connect anything, we can it. try it out. But from yesterday, if you set a couple of back end, the front end that you just show is actually something else. Uh, that's that's packaged. Yeah, repeat the question for. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I asked. Uh, Citrine is the back end, um, and then I was showing a front end. Uh, so, what if that was a separate thing? Um, that is part that we include into Citrine. Uh, it's a directus um, UI, which is an open source uh, database management UI. Um, so, yeah, that's included, and it is customizable. You can add uh, different categories, sections, modules, stuff like that into directus. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. So I, I'm curious. I, to what degree have you seen um, some of the, you know, the things that are that are hanging out there, the utility cohorts is the, you know, one example that comes to mind, and then even regulator cohorts that are expressing interest in looking at sort of a, a, a big CSMS application for what they need to do. Uh, so I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to take this out. Um, so the question was about um, large, yeah, large users, utility cohorts, um, if they've been looking for a solution like this. Is that yeah. accurate, fair to say? Um, we've talked to some large larger commercial entities um, who have been interested uh, and we've gone, I'm trying to think what I can say if it's not under NDA. We've gone uh, multiple rounds with some very large clients. Uh, nobody from the utility sector, um, so that hasn't happened. It's been mostly uh, commercial charging networks, uh, fleet management, some uh, home charging solutions, uh, but nobody from the utility side at this time. Yep. Sure. Uh, any other questions right now? All right. Thank you so much. And like I said, we'll be set up at the back if you want to put your hands on Citrine and take a look. Thanks. Okay. See if we can get the computer back up here and see if I can start to share. The screen again. So are we back? Okay. Um, charge bytes. I know Martin. You got a very. You got 30 seconds to meet before. I don't know. Do you want to run through something here, or you think that everything is better shown at the table in the back? Yeah. Maybe it's better to maybe it's better to see it first uh, before we uh, before we uh, go. Uh, I'll uh, go um, over any questions. So, um, <laughs> PKI provider. Say again. Your PKI provider. Uh, um, right, right now, we have just a um, cell time. So, for that demonstration, we'll go now. Okay, um, I don't know, uh, we, maybe we do those two things at the same time, the ones in the back. So I don't know, Kelvin, 
Um, you want to come up and maybe before, you know, uh, and maybe I use this to just talk a little bit about uh, TI, uh, you know, in a bit of a broader perspective, what we do inside this market of energy transition. So that's going to be a good, you know, a good pathway to, into some of the demos uh, we show we show at the back. I, I was planning to use those slides actually in the beginning and the morning here today, uh, but uh, yeah, as we know with the weather and so on, we switch things around. So <clears throat> let me come back to this now. Um, I saw part of this as well uh, yesterday uh, from uh, you know Keith Obania, who is our marketing uh, senior vice president, uh, talked about you know where TI uh, spends time in this energy transition. So. Um, in general, uh, we see it as, and I said I come from a team that is then, you know, working on a lot of reference designs, uh, trying to help customers specifically related to, um, you know, energy infrastructure. Um, and you see some of those end equipments on the slide here. So it might be string inverter, uh, grid scale ESS systems, fast chargers, smart metering, you know, wall boxes, micro inverter, power optimizers, and so on. Um, and when we when we look at those type of systems, it's basically in four areas where, you know, we believe that TI semiconductor technologies will play in this space. Um, to, uh, over the last uh, two days, there we spent a lot of time on that processing um, side of things. So that's the third bucket here um, on on the list. The two uh, the three other ones are then you know um, high voltage power conversion, uh, which. Uh, we're going to show, or there's some example of in the back uh, in the back end there as well. This obviously relates to, you know, a lot of uh, DC to DC, AC to DC uh, power conversion, as we've heard about, on, um, you know, uh, both in uh, intelligence charger here that, you know, that might if that might be that boost stage uh, that uh, you know take um, solar panel voltage and boost them up to a stable DC voltage or if it's an AC to DC converter, those are uh, type of technologies that we would see fall into that. Um, current and voltage sensing, um, you know, obviously uh, a lot of those chargers, they uh, include things like uh, e-metering functionality in there to be able to recognize how much energy uh, the charger has provided, um, or it might be things like RCD, so residual current detection and so on, or and isolation, insulation monitoring, or other type of functionality like that. So those are areas where you know the yeah, semiconductors also um, help uh, in this market. And then lastly, you know, on the battery management um, side, which then maybe even uh, mostly relates to our ESS business. Uh, but obviously, lithium-ion batteries are uh, they are <laughs> they are very. Uh, uh, they need a lot of uh, they need a lot of uh, care. Uh, so uh, you know we have battery monitors and you know do uh, whole reference designs for systems of you know building you know an uh, an ESS uh, an ESS uh, system. Uh, if that's then on the BMS side, so the battery monitor system, battery management system, but also of course then the power conversion side, which then maybe relates more to the first point here. So those four different technology areas combined, those are you know where my team then also has uh, expertise and system engineer and Kelvin in the back of the room here is, uh, you know, uh, that's going to uh, present some of the demos. He's going to be one, he's one, um, you know, um, of the examples of that uh, who works with a lot with our high voltage power uh, power conversion uh, side of things, for example. And um, if we then, and I'm not going to go through all the details of this slide here, you know, obviously, but yeah, you see here how we then start to break it down into more of TS products, uh, families, and categories of things like, um, you know, microcontrollers, or if it's FETs, or gate drivers, and, and uh, amplifiers, and, uh, you know, and uh, different type of uh, current sensors, and so on. So those are, uh, you know, those are then the... Uh, you know the products uh, behind it. Where my team very often get involved uh, with this is uh, when we try to put things together. So, like on to build an EV charging station that then obviously you know needs maybe processing and connectivity things. It needs current and voltage sensing relating to e metering, RCD, things like that. And then if it's building a DC charging station, we might even need some high voltage power conversion as well. And that's um, where you know my teams that very often get involved. There's a lot of you know different types of hardware, and maybe also combined with uh, software. Uh, when it comes to software, it's usually 
I would say, very low-level software that we get involved in, so like in the high-voltage power converters, we then tend to help write software for, you know, a, a T-type inverter, a Vienna rectifier, or, you know, something like that, uh, because this is um, software that is um, very directly, you know, impacting, uh, impacting the hardware. When it then comes to higher level software that maybe runs on Linux and so on, that's where we start to, you know, work with, uh, you know, all our partners or many of the partners in this room, so to say, uh, want to take use of, you know, open source uh, software and so on. And this is definitely an area where, um, you know, TI uh, is not, um, you know, it's not, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say we are, we are not experts on it and we are not, also not, uh, you know, trying to uh, sell uh, sell any software. Okay, um, Kelvin, do you want to come up and just uh, you know maybe talk briefly about this uh, before you before we then you know can go back and then we can look at both those demos you know right after each other. Maybe that's um, just from a logistics standpoint the easiest. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin Lee. I'm a system engineer uh, working in Henrik's team. I support EV charging. I focus more on, more on the hardware side of uh, EV charging. And today we have a demo showing the EV uh, level two charging demo here, uh, showing a various number of boards inside the demo back there. Um, this includes uh, a FiTech carrier board using uh, Pinex uh, software, and then we also have a TI analog board that supplies mainly the power. There's basically a flyback and some monitor and control circuits in there, like well detection and uh, RCD capability, residual current detection for safety. So it's a very straightforward demo. We're going to uh, flip some switches based on this handheld device that uh, interface with the charger. It does some pilot uh, wire communication showing the uh, status, low level status of the connection, unplug, plug, charging, and so on. Um, and then um, besides that, we also have a few other uh, hardware boards we want to uh, show uh, in addition to the AC charger uh, demo. Uh, we have a high voltage power board. It's a 10 kilowatt Vienna rectifier board that we want to show um, besides the AC charger. Um, demo. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Colin. So, I don't know, with that, you know, I think we have introduced all the demos, so maybe we try to, you know, maybe start with ChargePite then in the back. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we do that, and we'll go over the demos, uh, the three demos there, and then we come back and see if there's any additional questions. And, you know, from a timing perspective, we, we try to be done and ready by probably
Um, and we now quickly, even if we don't have any tools we both, we quickly now progress the setup for a target uh, charge session. Um, we don't have a plan at all, so what plans that this has would help be by somewhere else or someone else. I don't know this I don't know why it wasn't possible, but <laughs> actually now we can step in here and what we can demonstrate is um, how it works between the um, Everest system, the Everest base here, um, and our um, uh, EVCC system and some self-signed certificates right now. Normally we do that when we are in festivals, etc. We do that with object certificates, they separate testing uh, certificates. Now we have to just go do self-signed certificates. So what you will see is once I connect so Everest is now up and running. Simulation for that as well. We need to, we need to simulate or stimulate this thing that the thing is in the vehicle and the simulation is also up and running. So once I connect now the control pilot, as you see that's the only thing we need to care now, uh, we should see here some stuff going on. First of all, we see the stack. It's now it's running that was what Bionic yesterday showed the, the whole step. Uh, we see that. At some point, you see the important thing. I saw there is no, for Jim, there is no time charge. And it demonstrates that the whole station, the whole process is done very fast. Uh, of course, now it's a little, normally we would have a CSMF in the background, maybe a sensor that would be back and forth, or maybe some additional that would be like that. Might not be that. So, yeah, nothing. nothing yeah. Else.
some other functions that can support rise to this safety monitor and inspection issues like just return on detection and well detection and so forth as well detection. And actually creating another board for that specifies some well detection for a in the way you might show on this board. Uh, this design the PI design is
You can even put it up here. I think. <laughs>
sorry, I don't want to interrupt a lot of uh, uh, exciting conversations here, but uh, just wanted to uh, kind of officially wrap up. You know, we have the TI demo there, uh, Charge Bytes, very exciting demo that was uh, substituted in at the last minute. So we have the room for another half an hour, and then I think they're going to switch over to uh, a different event for tomorrow. So we can uh, grab coffee. Please use everything that we got there. You're going to be trapped in the airport for a while uh, while the rain settles. But yeah, if you have any questions for our demo owners or the Linux Foundation, uh, you can reach out to me or Alex or Dan um, using, um, I think there's an email address provided. And um, everyone has my email address, so give me some time to respond uh, after I get all your registration closed uh, emails. And yeah, I think Brandon Cantor is still walking around the room too. So any grid-related questions, uh, Brandon and Henrik can address those as well. And uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody uh, who spoke or was a demo owner for bringing things down, setting up equipment. Uh, really exciting to have the hopefully the first of many uh, EV charging summits for open source. And if Alex wants to say a couple words. All right, thanks, Brian. And, and really, thank you, TI, for hosting. It's uh, fantastic just having everything prepared. Everything went super smoothly, uh, so thank you. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I think this was a really fantastic uh, first open EV charging summit. Uh, I think we will have another one hopefully next year. We'll have to figure out exactly what, when, where. <laughs> Um, and really just my, my call to everybody of, hey, you know, the beauty of open source is it's there for you to get involved. Um, so go, you know, check out the code, get engaged in meetings. If you have questions, you know, get on the Discord or the Slack or wherever it is. Um, and, you know, kind of create what you want to exist. It's there for you to do that. Uh, so with that, thanks again for coming. Uh, we're going to get kicked out of here in less than 30 minutes. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. All right. <laughs> Bye.